recreating the theater experience at home, whether for movies or other media like games, has always had a sort of exclusive air about it. Most people probably assume that having such a setup is a fantasy that they'll never fulfill. As for me, I'm not quite there myself, but something I've discovered since starting to experiment with inexpensive used projectors a few years ago is that it is absolutely possible to just dip your toe in and get a pretty interesting experience. In some ways, affordable older projectors can be more useful than you might expect and also offer surprising benefits. But depending on your budget, needs, and what you play, there's also an argument to be made for starting with well, maybe not the absolute top tier multi-thousand dollar models, but at least mid-range models that might be rated for low input lag, a relative rarity in the current market. So this is a sort of chronicle of my experience with gaming on projectors thus far, including how well it tends to work for classic gaming, early HD games, and all the way up to today's 4K consoles with HDR. One of the weirdest little perks of being a video file is that you're the only one calling dibs on rooms without windows. No one else had any use for this one room with no windows in my parents' current house, and it's long been where I've stored my childhood books, excess bits of my vintage AV equipment collection, and other knickknacks, as well as where I've set up and played any games while visiting my parents. But even from the beginning, I was always thinking, one day, this room will have a projector. In this episode, we're going to be looking at five different projectors I've tested out in this room sporadically over the past three years. Some old, some newer, one very new. But let's get this out of the way first. Sorry, but we will not be exploring CRT projectors in depth here. I know that's gotta be a huge disappointment for some people, but CRT projectors are not only very difficult to find, let alone functioning and for an affordable price, but are also likely to need challenging maintenance. CRT projectors use individual red, green, and blue tubes that generally have estimated lifespans of 10,000 hours. And when the time comes for any one of them, you will never be able to get a replacement. And there is plenty that can go wrong if it hasn't already by the time you get it. My buddies from Video Game World here in North Carolina were lucky enough to get a couple of CRT projectors, but they've needed some work. They followed this video tutorial to refresh the glycol in the green tube, which cleared up the picture quite a bit. And they're optimistic that doing the same on the other tubes will improve things further. Light guns should work, although we had poor luck with the extremely makeshift screen setup we had available for shooting in the store. Remember, this one still needs a lot of work. If you get extremely, extremely lucky, you may be able to find later models that can look as clear as a PVM, which I also hear are far easier to calibrate for focus and convergence. This late 80s model isn't quite as capable from what I hear, but with a bit more work, it should look really nice too. It is a super cool technology and it is important for the classic gaming community to preserve what little of it remains, but you need to be kind of serious about it to get anywhere with it. CRT projectors are a whole other ball game from digital projectors and don't really fit the themes of more casual and economical projector use that I wanted to explore for this episode. This right here behind me is actually the RetroTINK 5X on a 2021 DLP projector from BenQ. You can get a pretty convincing CRT facsimile these days without an actual CRT projector. Also, before we get any further, I also want to emphasize that while I 
do fancy myself a video file and I'll be scrutinizing the pixels, upscaling and input lag readings pretty hardcore. I don't have vast experience with projectors in particular, nor have I felt that I'm ready to invest in turning this room in a house I don't even live in into a proper home theater with a screen and all the other trimmings. This is just a video by a relative projector newbie meant to inspire other projector newbies exploring their interesting qualities, challenges, compromises, features, and fun uses for gaming. So you got it? Then let's go. So the first projector I picked up was the InFocus Screenplay 7205, which I found at a Goodwill Operate Electronics and Gaming store in Charlotte called The Grid for like $30. While it may look like an office projector, this is from InFocus's mid-range home theater line and released in 2004. During another visit to The Grid, I happened upon the Marantz VP12S2, a 2002 model. And while it did cost me a bit more, 60 or so, it supposedly had a manufacturer suggested retail price of over $12,000. Well, I just could not resist seeing what such a seemingly premium projector might be like, even if it was nearly two decades old. These are both HD digital projectors using DLP technology. And yes, they are rather out of date. Is it even worth fiddling around with projectors of such a vintage, even if they could be had for such prices? Well, I think it is, especially for upscaled classic games and native 720p content. 720p hasn't held up too well on modern 4K screens, which can be particularly troublesome for PlayStation 3, or even the majority of backwards compatible Xbox 360 games on Xbox Series X that haven't been blessed with a 4K facelift. Even so-called 720p LCD TVs have generally actually been 1360 by 768, meaning that 720p is still scaled on them. Only 768p from a device like a PC will be displayed natively as demonstrated on the left with a checkerboard pattern of 4x4 pixels. One of the few options for getting 720p looking really clean is to do something like run it through a VGA CRT with the appropriate converters, if you're lucky enough to have such a CRT. But hark, I say, what about these old digital projectors? They may not have HDMI, but they do have DVI and their native resolution is in fact 1280 by 720. Imagine 720p looking good in 2021. There's just something so pleasing about seeing each pixel nestled cozily within its own little bubble, don't you think? No upscale to 768p, 1080p, or 4K. Less blur than old LCDs. Just native 720p, plain and simple. But note that if you end up with an in-focus, they tended to use a proprietary DVI connector that's a bit wider, but it was pretty easy to find one that adapts it to HDMI for cheap. And you know, it's not just Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii U. 720p is still heavily used by all sorts of devices, such as the classic edition mini consoles. Hooking up the Mega Drive Mini to the in-focus projector was a big hit with the family a few Thanksgivings ago. Or consider the Switch. For any games that might fall to 720p or even lower due to dynamic resolution scaling, projecting a lower resolution to begin with helps mitigate the impact of the overall softer image. Panzer Paladin really nailed scalable HD pixel art by being designed for 180p, a 6x 1080p scale and a 4x 720p scale for handheld mode, which it also displays flawlessly when docked to a 720p projector. Mm. Even for the higher resolution Switch games like those that might be 900p or 1080p, I've never really felt like I'm missing out when projecting at 720p. And in some ways, it can even smooth over the rough edges a touch. Adding all the more to my unlikely love for these old projectors that can't even do any better than 720p are their friendliness with classic consoles via both the RetroTink 5X and the open source scan converter. 
The RetroTINK 5X works with both projectors, even in frame lock mode, but the OSSC needs to pass through something else for it to work with the in focus, like this HDMI audio breakout box that I use for connecting my headphones. While some newer mods and scalers like the RetroTINK 5X have polyphase scan lines that look nice at higher resolutions and varying levels of zoom, 720p is often a sweet spot for integer-based scan line implementations, including the OSSCs giving a nice balance between the thickness of each scan line and the darkened gaps in between. And if you prefer to not use scan lines, I think the 3X pixel look is also very clean. Amazingly, both the InFocus and the Marantz take two of the fussiest consoles for upscaling, the Super Nintendo and RGB modded NES via both the OSSC and the RetroTINK 5X. I can't say for sure whether this is common among early 2000s 720p projectors or whether I just got lucky, but I suspect it may point toward a trend. If you don't have an upscaler, projectors from around this era are sure to have analog inputs. In fact, the thing that drew my eye to the in-focus projector was actually the D-terminal input. What a weird thing to see in the US. Both the in-focus and Marantz projectors feature DCDI by Ferroja, a company that was actually a pretty big deal in the early 2000s video file scene for its deinterlacing and upscaling technologies. However, the 480i handling was meant for video content and is not necessarily great for games. Input lag on the analog inputs is also far from ideal. 55 milliseconds on the Marantz and around 70 to 80 milliseconds of variable lag on the in-focus. However, the lag situation on the digital input for both projectors is a totally different story. The in-focus turns in an extremely respectable 16 milliseconds at its native 720p. That's only one frame of lag for 60fps. 480p only goes up a bit to 20 milliseconds. The Marantz, on the other hand, is remarkably consistent, reporting right around 21 milliseconds for every resolution I can test on it, including 480i. However, you should not expect great results with 480i pass-through with digital inputs. Instead, 2x Bob on the OSSC actually looks better than you'd expect on the Marantz, while motion-adaptive deinterlacing via the RetroTINK 5X looks as great as you'd expect on both. So, if you stumble across a projector like these in a thrift store, you might want to Google if any lag readings or other info on the model is out there before you buy, but even if not, you know, they're often less expensive than like TVs and LCD monitors at these stores. And you may very well end up with something that provides a really neat gaming experience for very little money. And it might just give you an idea of whether a more elaborate home theater setup is something you'd like to consider for the future. But believe it or not, you can actually buy a brand new projector for a similar price to what I spent on these semi-ancient ones. I bought the Anchor Nebula Prism when it was on sale for $40 on Amazon in late 2019, but similar models go for about $70 when not on sale. While the Nebula Prism can take in 1080p through its lone HDMI input, it can only display at 480p. The light is dim and the colors are completely devoid of life. Even with the lights off and no ambient light, the picture is just not satisfying at all. The input lag is also extremely unstable, averaging around 50 milliseconds if you're sending it a native 480p signal and well over 100 milliseconds if you send it a 720p or 1080p signal that then has to downscale to 480p. Sure, there are things like the GC video mods and devices for GameCube and Wii that only output 480p, but even those just don't feel like a good fit for this projector since the brightness, color, and input lag are all so poor. Now, Anchor actually has all kinds of Nebula projectors, and the Prism is the only one I've tried, so I don't mean to disparage the whole brand. I mean, they have just a ton of models for a huge range of prices that do 720p, 1080p, and even 4K. But when it comes to this absolute bottom rung entry level, I'd rather spend that same $40 to $70 or even less on an older projector that was actually a nice model for its time. But all right, let's suppose you've reached the stage where you're convinced a projector setup is exactly what you want and you're willing to invest some substantial money into it. Well, 
I've been holding out on doing this episode until I could actually compare my older models against a brand new projector that supports modern features like 4K and HDR. So when Ben Q asked if we would be interested in a review sample of their latest gaming projector, the TK700 STI, it sounded exactly like the sort of thing I'd been hoping to test out. Even at $1,700, the BenQ TK700 STI is actually more in the mid-range projector market, which also happens to kind of be in the pricing territory of a super nice TV. More expensive than a 55-inch OLED, but less than a 65-inch one. But even if you were willing to spend more money, higher-priced cinephile projectors may not provide what you want for gaming. If BenQ's claims of the TK700 STI being the world's first 4K HDR projector capable of delivering only one frame of lag are to be believed anyway. You may not be able to get the black levels of OLED, nowhere close to be honest, but you absolutely can get a very big, bright picture. For the space available to me in this room, I was able to use the zoom control on the lens to blow the screen up to 97 inches diagonal and it's only 76 and a half inches from the wall. This is a much larger picture than I have room to produce with, say, the Marantz, which projects a 75 and a half inch picture when it's 96 inches from the wall. This is due to the BenQ being classified as a short throw projector, which is exactly what it sounds like. The projector doesn't have to be so far away from the wall, making possible bigger pictures in smaller rooms. Having been living in OLED heaven for the past four years, black levels not being perfect is always the toughest compromise to accept when it comes to any other display technology. The good news for the BenQ projector is that it's bright enough that the perceived black levels in scenes with plenty of color and highlights is pretty decent, even when projected on a plain white wall, in a dark room at least. But for this next shot, I've way overexposed the camera so that you can get a closer approximation to how my eye perceives a black or mostly black screen, such as what you see when launching a game on Nintendo Switch. Yeah, I wish this could be better. Some projectors, including other models from BenQ, have dynamic iris features that can greatly improve black levels in dark scenes. Physically irising down to reduce the amount of light passing through as less light is needed for the scene. But here on the TK700 STI, we have a sort of budget version of that. It's called Smart Eco Mode, which actually reduces the brightness of the light source itself depending on scene content. Personally, I don't see myself using it because the transition is very noticeable between scene fades and is made far worse by virtue of the colors looking a lot different between Eco and Normal modes. Since the vast majority of my experience with HDR video is with OLED, I was really curious if DLP would be able to convey a similar sense of light sources actually being bright. Obviously, no HDR comparison in a video present in standard dynamic range is really going to be an accurate representation of what it actually feels like to see HDR in person, but I have been very pleased with how HDR looks on the TK700 STI. While it may lack the full contrast of OLED due to not having true black, the overall impact of HDR remains extremely effective. 2160p output from PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X certainly looks crisp, and in my opinion the image quality also holds up very well even when using any 60fps or ray tracing modes that may drop the rendering resolution. It might seem silly to even compare this to a 720p projector, but well, there you have it. Now, before I get into the game mode settings on the BenQ projector, which will actually take us down a rather fun and unexpected rabbit hole about native resolutions, let's have a little intermission and take a detour into the subject of projection screen materials, because I can't find anywhere else in the video to put it. But as you've seen, I'm kind of doing it wrong by just projecting onto a white wall here. But since this isn't meant to be a super serious projector setup yet, I mean, whatever, right? I mean, if you want to do this too, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but the nearly universally held mantra among projector aficionados is that you really should get some kind of proper screen. So I ordered a few things just so we could get a basic idea of just how motivated you or I should be to go that extra mile. 
First, I bought some white rock lawn blackout fabric, something I'd seen recommended here and there as a good basis for a DIY screen. I also ordered a packet of screen material samples from a website called Carl's Place that specializes in projector screens to see if there was anything of the gray variety that might suit me. Gray and black screen materials are typically meant for increasing perceived contrast in environments with ambient light, which I try to have almost none of in this room when I'm actually playing, but there is a lot of light bounce from the projection itself. An ideal home theater is supposed to have dark walls, ceiling, floor, furniture, etc. Maybe someday, but not today. So I was curious if gray materials might improve my perceived black levels in the meantime without negatively impacting the overall picture. Keep in mind that these are just quick tests to get a general idea of whether the screen materials are improving black levels without overly detracting from brightness, and there's just no way I'm going to calibrate color for every sample. So the perception in most cases might be that the naked wall is best, and I suspect the TK700 STI may be tuned for this out of the box, but adjustments to white balance and overall color would be warranted for a more permanent screen installation. While well, I actually did build a full 76 inch screen with the Rocklawn fabric, mostly for the Marantz and in focus since they project a smaller size, in truth, I feel that the white Rocklawn blackout fabric does almost nothing worthwhile in this environment. I guess it is handy as a travel screen though. As for the gray screen materials from Carl's Place, for a room with the lights off, I think the Flexigray and Ultra Gray are the ones that are most interesting to me. Both improve black levels a bit, and the impact on bright scenes isn't too strong. Some materials have a bit of texture, which is neat in some situations, but can also create a bit of a sparkle effect. The ambient light rejecting sheet seemed really interesting to me at first, but it also appears to produce hot spots. See how the brightness doesn't seem as uniform? Just like I'm testing in this light colored room with the lights off, you just have to do these tests for yourself in your own environment to decide what'll work for you. I do hear that if you have an ideally dark room, unlike this one, you probably should just go with a white material for the screen. Although I get the feeling that almost everyone has a different opinion when it comes to projector stuff. Right, so game mode features on the BenQ TK700 STI. The actual function of these are largely obscured by marketing gobbledygook, but the results are far more interesting than the dumbed down marketing of look down the sights faster, kick the ball a frame earlier, drift better. The three game mode subtypes are basically color presets. There's FPS, which is over bright in the shadows to help you frag better or whatever. RPG, which is what I use almost all the time since the colors are more accurate, and SPG or sports game, which just has unnatural oversaturated colors. I really don't get the point of it. The fast mode setting then is what helps reduce input lag, which BenQ claims can bring input lag down to 16.67 milliseconds for 60 frames per second content. With the time sleuth set for 1080p, we see that both the low and high fast mode settings give us readings of slightly over 17 milliseconds, which may not line up exactly with BenQ's documentation, but this is nonetheless very promising. We can't use the time sleuth to test 4K lag, but the old fashioned hit the jump button and count the frames test with the Xbox Series X outputting 2160p at least lets us see that both low and high settings for fast mode appear to provide identical button response. But we can't get an exact measurement for 4K output lag since we don't know the game's inherent input delay. We'll just have to trust BenQ on it being around 16 to 17 milliseconds or so, just like with 1080p. But there's another angle to fast mode that reveals something super interesting. As it turns out, many 4K projectors, including the TK700 STI, keep the cost down by utilizing a 1080p imaging chip, which then constructs a 2160p image through a technique called pixel shifting, which I first learned about over on projectorreviews.com. I'm sure there must be clarity advantages to a native 4K chip, but pixel shifting is nonetheless delivering the pixels the console sends it. When a game offers a native 4K mode, you're still getting more clarity and less aliasing over, say, a 1440p performance mode. 
a PC outputting 2160p might be a clear demonstration of what is lost and what isn't from the pixel shifting technique. I don't consider unscaled windows to be a likely use case for a 4K projector, but you can see that at one-to-one -one sizing, every pixel is basically represented. Yes, the details are a bit fuzzy, even a little CRT-like maybe, but this is actually a good match for modern game rendering techniques and, in my opinion, does not result in perceptibly less detail in games that support higher resolutions. I'm sure BenQ and other projector manufacturers would wish that we'd just pretend this is regular native 4K with no asterisks attached. But here's the weird thing. I'm glad that this is a pixel shift projector because it comes with a side effect that is super relevant to my interests as a person who plays games of all resolutions across all generations. And fast mode helps reveal this fascinating quirk. Back to the example of a 2160p desktop, I personally cannot see any visual difference between fast mode off and fast mode low. So I'd say there is no reason to not enable it. But then if we go to high, whoa, what happened here? Everything's gone soft, but the screen's pixels are now bigger? Oh, oh! This was a bit of a mind blow moment for me. A pixel shift 4K projector can effectively, effectively have two native resolutions. In this case, 2160p and 1080p. Now that is cool, right? Right? Like CRTs have a range of supported resolutions, but no native resolution, which means any resolution it accepts can look very clean. Digital TVs and monitors are bound by their panel's fixed pixel grid, but since a projector's core imaging device is not the surface that the picture is ultimately viewed on, it can do the pixel shift thing and give us not one, but two resolutions that are handled nearly equally as well. So basically, when you set fast mode to high, the TK700 STI stops pixel shifting to reconstruct 4K and simply outputs the 1080p that its imaging chip natively handles. Check it out. The Xbox Series X dashboard is still 1080p even when the console is set for 4K. It doesn't look particularly amazing on any 4K screen, but doesn't it look a lot cleaner when downsampled to its actual native resolution this way? You aren't gaining any detail with the 4K upscale, so by turning off the pixel shifting, you're basically able to match the source image to native 1080p, despite being a 2160p signal. I mean, it's probably not worth toggling modes just for the dashboard, but let's suppose you were playing a last-gen game that's 1080p or less. Or a game that has FPS boost, which often forces Xbox One S graphics parameters. This way you can get a cleaner image without a forced upscale to 4K, which is exactly what any 4K TV would do, regardless of whether you had the console set to 4K or 1080p. It would still be upscaled on a TV in the end. Now, I get the impression that projectors tend to lag behind monitors and TVs when it comes to widely integrating the latest video standards, so it's not a huge surprise that the TK700 STI can't do 4K at 120Hz. But the compromise of going down to 1080p to use 120Hz doesn't seem so bad to me when it looks so clean. 120Hz modes on consoles are often low res anyway. What's nice is that if you do feed the projector a signal that's 1080p or less, it automatically reverts to its native 1080p form. So it doesn't matter if the fast mode is set to low or high when using, say, a Nintendo Switch. I couldn't say whether all pixel shift projectors behave this way when presented with 1080p content, but I'm really into this quasi-dual native resolution situation. There is a quirk, however, in that fast mode can only be activated when using 1080p or 2160p. This means that, unfortunately, 480p and 720p will be twice as laggy, around 34 milliseconds by my readings. This also applies to retro upscalers or HDMI mods that might offer resolutions like 960p, 1200p, or 1440p. So, while 1440p from the RetroTINK 5X does work and does look great, especially with some of the newer scale line modes that have been added, I would recommend setting your device to 1080p instead so that the projector reverts to its native 1080p and fast mode can be enabled, giving us only one frame of lag. 1080p will still look pretty darn great no matter whether you prefer the raw pixel look or the scan line look. When using scan lines, I actually like to use the FPS game mode to brighten the colors. 
Mmm, I gotta say, there's just something about skin lines blown up this big that is really satisfying. And as with my old InFocus and Marantz projectors, the TK700 STI can even handle both NES and Super Nintendo via the OSSC and the RetroTINK 5X in frame lock mode. Now, BenQ specializes in DLP projectors, and while I think DLP has a reputation for being pretty premium tech, it has a certain characteristic that is a non-issue for some, a mild to moderate annoyance for people like me, and a total deal breaker for others. It's the infamous rainbow effect. In Focus, Marantz, and BenQ projectors we've looked at in this episode are all DLP projectors, which stands for Digital Light Processing. Their core component is a digital micro-mirror device, or DMD, an array of tiny, tiny mirrors that correspond to each pixel and rotate individually to reflect or not reflect light, which is blasted really quickly through a spinning color wheel to create each full color frame. But each color hits the screen some milliseconds apart. Let's look at the projection through the spinning blades of a fan, each of which blocks whichever colors are on the wall at that point in the frame. And as such, we can't see the pure white color of the image through the gaps. So as our eyes dart around different points of the scene, we might see a brief flash of a rainbow-like artifact in our peripheral vision. For some people, this is incredibly distracting, while many people supposedly can't even see it at all. I personally don't see it to an annoying degree in most games, but I've found that it's the worst for me in scenes of high contrast and slower paced games with adventure game elements since the less dynamic camera movement creates a perfect backdrop to paint rainbow trails across as my eye scans the environment for objects to examine. These factors collided for me in the medium in such a way that made me decide I'd prefer to play it some other time on my OLED at home. Rainbow artifacts can also manifest from moving the camera really quickly in-game. It's impossible to truly capture what it looks like in person, but with this slow motion shot, you can sort of get an idea of how, since the colors lag behind each other by just milliseconds, areas of high contrast can show staggered color information. However, I have found that when playing games on the BenQ just for fun rather than for testing, I rarely move the camera fast enough during normal gameplay to cause the issue to the point where I notice. And when I do, my eye tends to focus on points of the screen where the effect won't manifest, like my character. I saw camera pan rainbows sometimes while playing through the FF7 Remake Yuffie DLC, but not enough to be as annoyed by it as I feared I would be. I don't play first-person games all that often, but the effect can be a bit bothersome there depending on the game and setting. Luckily for me though, I tend to not see this in sprite-based games, even fast-moving ones. I'm not saying it's not there, but it's just not to the point that I see it while playing. So while this isn't a problem most of the time, in most of the types of games I play, it is there and it's very much a your mileage may vary situation. DLP remains popular, so obviously plenty of people either don't see these problems or aren't terribly bothered by them. But what's the alternative? Well, I have one more projector to look at today, which offers another perspective that I think is important to show as a point of comparison. Shout out to Matt Lisi of Insurrection Industries, who not only loaned me some camera gear that greatly facilitated in the production of this episode, but also offered to let me borrow his own projector, the Epson Home Cinema 3500. This is a much newer projector than my InFocus or Marantz, hailing from the mid-2010s, but it is limited to native 1080p. No 4K pixel shifting like the BenQ, but Epson has utilized the concept in other models. Like the Nebula Prism, it's an LCD projector rather than DLP. But unlike the Nebula Prism, it actually produces a very pleasing picture. The Epson is more specifically a 3-LCD projector, which is actually a specific brand and technology that was originally developed by Epson, much like how Texas Instruments created and licenses DLP. There are a ton of commonly side pros and cons to LCD versus DLP. DLP projectors usually don't have the air filters that LCD projectors need to have occasionally cleaned or replaced. People have all kinds of different opinions on which technology produces better colors, higher contrast, debates over the longevity of the product. 
If you're interested, you can find a nigh endless supply of articles comparing the two technologies. But what we're doing here should absolutely not be considered a benchmark for how all three LCD projectors compare against DLP. But I certainly can demonstrate that both are very capable projection technologies. Let's get the bad news out of the way first this time. Good thing Matt bought this projector for outdoor movie nights because this specific model is really not great for gaming. Toggling between fast and fine modes gives us input lag readings of about 44 milliseconds and over 100 milliseconds respectively. 44 milliseconds might be passable for some people, especially if you're not into action games, but 100 milliseconds is not okay. Fast mode also dramatically reduces the image quality, and I haven't found any way to adequately mitigate its nasty effects through other settings on this specific model. Despite my good luck with low lag on those old InFocus and Marantz projectors, I keep hearing that input lag is a serious problem in the projector world, although I am told that two frames of lag or less is becoming more and more common these days. So since we know that the Home Cinema 3500 is not a good choice for gaming anyway, we're going to switch back to fine mode from this point on so that we can get a better view of how three LCD and DLP might compare with two mid-range models. Despite the difference in age of a half decade or so, I think the comparison is more fair than you might think. Case in point, peak brightness for both units feels similar enough, at least at the relative distances from the wall that I have them placed at. After all, the Home Cinema 3500 is not a short throw projector, so I can't make as large of a picture with it in this space. But both are totally usable even with the lights on, although I would prefer to avoid doing so for my personal use. Black levels, however, are a big differentiating area. With no special settings enabled, both have fairly similarly washed out black levels. But settings on both projectors can improve the situation to greater or lesser degrees. I already mentioned the TK700 STI Smart Eco Mode. I don't particularly care for it. But the Home Cinema 3500 has a dynamic iris feature, which Epson dubs Auto Iris. While it may not save on lamp life, the visual effect is impressive. On black screens or scenes with only a bit of light, Auto Iris can drop the black to an impressively low level. You might notice the transition in situations where, say, company logos fade in and out upon booting a game, but during gameplay, to the extent I can play with this much lag, I've found it to be much less obtrusive than Smart Eco. You might notice that text on a mostly black screen will be darker than normal, but overall, I could see myself using this feature if I had it. So then, if we compare Auto Iris against Smart Eco on a perfectly black screen, well, I guess Smart Eco does darken the image quite a bit, but you can't really even see the Home Cinema 3500 in this shot at all. Only if I bring up the levels with an editing effect like this can you clearly see where the Epson is. While I don't have time to fully calibrate both in a way that would make further direct comparisons particularly fair, and it would be a bit pointless since the Home Cinema 3500 is not something you should be seeking out for gaming anyway, the main takeaway here should be that both 3 LCD and DLP can produce really nice pictures, although here you might notice that the BingQ has less precise black outlines due to the effects of the lens's chromatic aberration. All of the projectors I've tested have at least some chromatic aberration, including the Epson, but the optics on the BingQ do seem to be rather less premium. But bad as it may look up close, I actually can't even see it while sitting back on the couch, even on the BingQ. So if the choice is a higher priced lens or reduced input lag, I'd easily take the faster input response. But when it comes to DLP rainbows versus no rainbows, Hmm. The lack of rainbow artifacts is a huge selling point of 3 LCD for those sensitive to seeing them on DLP. However, you will likely get a bit more blurring with fast camera motion compared to DLP. The way the camera captures it is simply not accurate to how my eye perceives it, but just imagine your typical LCD blur. And just as with LCD TVs and monitors, I'm sure it varies a lot by model. This one is over half a decade old, but your tolerance for rainbows versus blur is probably the number one consideration to take into account when choosing a projector technology. Now, one last thing I gotta at least acknowledge are light source types and maintenance. 
Lamp is the term that tends to get used for the traditional projector light source. This includes the actual bulb and the housing it sits in. And of course, they don't last forever. The BenQ TK700 STI lamp has an estimated life of 4,000 hours in normal lamp mode. That's maybe 60 to 100 RPGs. Maybe double if you use Smart Eco. In some ways that sounds like a lot and in other ways it doesn't. But my understanding is that relatively early on, most lamps lose some amount of brightness and then will dim significantly by the end of life. I swear, my Marantz must be dimmer than it was when I first got it. I'd like to preserve it as a native 720p display, but obtaining the right part for such an old projector seems both difficult and expensive from what I've seen in my searches thus far. So do you buy replacement lamps now while you can, or just move on to another projector when the time comes? Well, I think the hope is that this isn't going to be a consideration forever. There are also LED and laser-based light sources, but the impression I get is that laser is really promising, but very expensive right now. But hopefully it won't always be. And then if it gets more established in the consumer market, we won't have to worry so much about decreased performance over time, replacements, or noisy fans. Speaking of which, yeah, do consider that. I usually don't hear the fans at all since I usually use headphones while playing here, but also don't forget that a projector lamp will heat up a small room like this. Just things to keep in mind. You know, as I've worked on this episode, I've ping-ponged back and forth. Well, maybe I could make a projector work in my main setup at home. But oh yeah, I see rainbows in some games a lot more than other games, and boy, I sure wish I had a projector with a dynamic iris for better black levels. So for now at least, I think my projectors will continue to just be a fun thing for me to mess around with when I visit my parents to get a bit of a different experience. But you know, I don't doubt that one day I'll succumb to the call to create a more elaborate projector setup, whether here or at home. And at least I now have a better idea of what to look for when the time comes. And if you feel the same calling but still don't know where to start, I'd say start small. Find you a cheap old 720p projector with a digital input, plug in your PS3 or even your Switch or your OSSC, and see where it leads you.